Uh, thanks so much for joining us this afternoon for our uh, next off COVID conversation. Um, and I'm very uh, pleased to uh, introduce Dr. Pravesh Jagdandan, who's one of the occupational health physicians at OCOW and also part of our COVID and infectious disease response team. And he's uh, uh, going to host our guest today. So I'm going to turn over the microphone to him and, uh, and then we'll go from there. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you very much, Val, and good morning to uh, the people from BC and welcome Dr. Cole and uh, good afternoon to everyone else from Ontario. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce this topic and be a moderator. Uh, we have Dr. Susan Cole, who's uh, presenting from BC and it's about 10.30 in the morning and thank you very much, Dr. Cole, for uh, taking this up this invitation and educating us further on this very important topic. Uh, the format is that I will do a brief introduction and background on, on Ontario, and then I'll hand over to Dr. Ko. Um, so when we think about COVID, uh, what strikes me is, is how things have changed from the start. And when I think about this, I think about uh, because I'm in occupational health and we look at health and safety all the time. So it's risk perception. So risk perception is defined as people's judgment and assessment of hazards that might pose immediate or long-term threats to the health and well-being. So it's an immediate or a long-term threat to the health and well-being. What we know in February, March of 2020, at the start of COVID, the risk perception was extremely high. It was an unknown virus. There was no treatments, there was no immunization, lots of unknowns lots of people dying, uh, lots of mortality. And with time, we see this risk perception has evolved. So from being at a high risk perception, so to our current state where it appears that most people are at the state of a low risk perception. They, they look at this as being just another cold or a flu. Now, we that are working in the field, kind of look at this and say, well, this is not really a correct risk, per risk percep perception of, of what's happening. And Dr. Koh, with her more than 30 years of experience of working in the trenches, she works in a clinical practice and she's been working throughout this COVID uh, in the hospitals and, and in long-term care. So, so she has a very real life experience of what the risk perception ought to be at this stage. And the reason why we have this sort of low risk perception in the general population is that the message out there is kind of mixed. So when the message is not trustworthy or it's a mixed message from the politicians, from public health and from whoever else, people start you know, to get a false impression of, of really what it is. Uh, the reporting is not as what it is as before and people are not seeing the debt but we know that the mortality is still significant and Dr. Ko is going to talk about that. Uh, just quickly on the current numbers, week three and week four in Ontario, uh, looking at both the flu and the cold, uh, if you look at the slide from public health, you'll see that for influenza A, B, 1% uh, of tested results, uh, RSV about 9%. Uh, when you look at this, you'll see that the denominators for A, B, and RSV are the same, 2,200 uh, uh, tested cases in the two-week period, uh, in the third and fourth week, sorry, in the one-week period. Uh, because currently in Ontario, when the swab for during the winter, they'll just automatically test for all those three viruses. Therefore, those denominators are the same. Uh, then we look at, at uh, COVID numbers and we see 25% of the 4,000, 4,500 tested. So still a big difference in numbers. I mean, there's there's lots of debate about testing and how's it done. And, and if John uh, from OCAR is around, I'm sure he'll, he'll, he'll be able to give us a long lecture on, on, on all the controversies around this. But just the slide demonstrates that COVID is still real, the numbers are still high, and, and just a little bit more on the seriousness if we look at uh, hospital admissions, uh, week three and week four, uh, ranging between 250 to 320 uh, admissions in the hospital, um, which translates to almost 40 people being admitted to hospital every day. 
And again, you look at to the bottom of the slide, you'll see that the vulnerable age group is from 60 above. Uh, 80 above, most of them are not working. 60 and above, still a significant amount of the work workforce. So still high numbers in that group. And this slide goes from 40 to 59, but in, in the literature will tell us, you know, from 50 starts to increase quite significantly. Uh, same similar thing borne out by the number of deaths. Um, third and fourth week again, averaging about seven people dying from the disease every day. Uh, so again, still significant numbers. And we know in Ontario, there's no regular testing as previous. So we turn to wastewater and, and a very just overview of the graph, uh, January, February, kind of tracking up there versus March, April last year. Again, there's, if you just look at this, you'll, you'll, you'll kind of realize that there's no major decrease in these numbers. The numbers are still significant. Um, and, and just an estimate, estimate of the raw clinical cases. Uh, there's a 10,000 mark, and if you look at the right of the slide, I mean, the estimate for February, five to 10,000 cases uh, for the week. Uh, so still, still, still significant amount of cases, and this will translate into significant amount of morbidity. Uh, and at this stage, uh, Dr. Ko will educate us further. Uh, and I mentioned uh, Dr. Ko's background in, in family practice. In addition, she's the associate professor of UBC Faculty of Medicine, and she's a member of Protect Our Province, British Columbia. Dr. Ko, I'll hand this over to you to share, do a slide share. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really honored to be here with you today, and I'd like to thank the Occupational Health Clinics of Ontario Workers for inviting me to give this discussion on long COVID. Um, again, it's a real honor, um, and it's a good morning in people in BC and a good afternoon to people in Ontario. I'm just going to st start my slide share. Um, I'd like to first say that I have no conflicts of interest, and I'm doing this as a volunteer with Protect Our Province BC, which is a non-profit, non-partisan group. Um, before we start, I'd like to acknowledge that I work and live in the ancestral, traditional, and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Can you see my slides there? Looks good. Thanks. So, my discussion is going to be divided in three parts. What we know about long COVID, the impact on workers and occupational health, and part three will be on long COVID treatment. As a family doctor working in the trenches during this pandemic, I've seen over a thousand cases or more of long COVID and I'm seeing increasing numbers of long COVID cases every day. I'd like to share three vignettes of long COVID cases from my practice. These patients had their COVID infections before vaccinations were available, and they have all consented for me to present their cases. So case number one is a 33-year-old registered nurse. She became infected with COVID after a hospital outbreak. Initially, she was so fatigued she had to nap many times per day. She had memory loss with short-term memory loss, as well as difficulty finding words. She was so tired that if she walked up a hill, she would have to lie down for two days. And now, even two years after she got this diagnosis, the other day she went to lift her baby several times out of the crib when he was sick, and that extra bit of exertion was enough that she had to lie down for the rest of the day, and she didn't have enough breath to sing him a lullaby. Her case was initially accepted by WorkSafe BC, but all her tests were normal and WorkSafe BC says she's fit to return to work. Case two is a 27-year-old childcare worker. She caught COVID on the job, the child daycare center. Her symptoms were initially very mild. She had a low grade fever and a little bit of congestion, but she also felt extremely tired. She had symptoms of dizziness. The dizziness was investigated and was initially thought by the neurologist to maybe be a seizure disorder, but all the tests were normal. She also developed acute appendicitis and had to have an appendectomy. But the reason she could not go to work was because of her memory loss. She could not actually remember where the gas pedal and brake pedal of her car were, so she could not drive. She Since then, she had had, had reinfections with COVID in November 2022 and January 2023, 
with each infection having more severe symptoms. Case three is a 21 year old student. She caught COVID while in high school, but she had difficulty getting diagnosed. Um, she, previous to having long COVID, she had depression and anxiety. So eventually she was diagnosed, it took about two years. She now has been diagnosed with having posterior orthostatic tachycardia. She has feelings of fast heart rate when she stands up with her heart rate going up over 100 beats per minute. She has also been diagnosed with myalgic encephalitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, with symptoms of tiredness, dizziness, sleep disturbance, muscle and joint pain, memory loss and concentration issues. And as a part of long COVID, she also has post-exertional malaise. So any kind of exertion, whether physical, mental, makes her feel very short of breath and tired. So what do we know about long COVID? Long COVID is referred to the post-acute sequelae of COVID-19 or post-COVID syndrome. People with long COVID are also called long haulers. The World Health Organization defines it as the continuation or development of new symptoms three months after the initial SARS-CoV-2 infection, with these symptoms lasting for at least two months with no other explanation. The Nature article on long COVID November 2022 defines it as a multi-system condition comprising often severe symptoms that follow a severe acute respiratory syndrome of SARS-CoV-2 infection. But the time definition is still evolving, with the definition in the UK and US being as short as four weeks of symptoms only. Epidemiology. At this point, it is estimated that 65 million people worldwide have long COVID. The World Health Organization estimates that 17 million people in Europe have it, which consists of 10 to 20 percent of people who are infected with SARS-CoV-2. Stats can makes the estimate of 1.4 million people or 15 percent of people who are infected with COVID. More women than men have had it. Most cases are in people who have no previous underlying health conditions, and the majority of these long COVID cases have been in non-hospitalized patients with mild acute illnesses. At this point, the mechanisms of long COVID are not 100% known, but there are current theories about what we think causes long COVID. Number one is immune system malfunction, including an increased difficulty of the immune system in fighting off common infections, and a reactivation of viral infections such as Epstein-Barr and human herpes viruses. Number two, disruption of normal intestinal bacteria. Number three, autoimmunity with the body at war with itself. Number three, blood clotting and endothelial abnormalities leading to stroke and heart attacks. And finally, dysfunctional neurological signaling, which leads to long COVID symptoms such as dizziness and numbness. The veteran affairs studies on COVID have been really important. Much of the current data we have on COVID comes from these studies, which use large electronic databases to track veterans. The studies published in August and September 2022 showed that in 150,000 people within the first year of even mild infections with COVID, there are serious cardiovascular effects such as sudden cardiac death, myocardial infarction, dysrhythmias, cardiac inflammation, as well as neurological effects such as stroke, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, Guillain-Barre, and depression. In yet another veteran affairs study published in Nature, reinfection with COVID were found to lead to increased hospitalizations, death, and long-term effects on cardiovascular, pulmonary, GI, neurological, hematological, musculoskeletal effects, as well as effects on mental health and increased risk of diabetes. Long COVID can affect just about every system and organ in the body, including the brain, lungs, heart, liver, digestive system, and reproductive organs. In addition, long COVID is associated with increased mental health issues such as depression, anxiety, and suicidal ideation. 50% of people with long COVID also meet the diagnostic criteria for myalgic encephalitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, with key symptoms of fatigue, sleep disturbance, post-exertional malaise, and pain. It's interesting to note that at the start of the pandemic, the MECFS community sounded the alarm about post-viral syndromes, but no one listened. Unfortunately, during this pandemic, 
COVID has been minimalized in children, but children have not escaped long COVID and they have symptoms very similar to adults. In the UK, there are 58,000 children with long COVID as of November, 2022. Reinfection causes a recurrence of long COVID in 58% of children who were in recovery or remission according to data from long COVID kids. Unfortunately, in Canada, we do not have as accurate statistics as the UK on how many kids have long COVID. Long COVID can affect healthy young adults, as seen as a study at George Washington University, which showed that 36% of faculty and staff had long COVID. The mean age was 23. Long COVID is a clinical diagnosis. The US government August 2022 services and supports for longer term impacts of COVID-19 reports stated that no laboratory tests can definitively distinguish long COVID from other causes of illness. It is a clinical diagnosis. Long COVID is not a diagnosis of exclusion. Unfortunately, one of the outcomes of COVID has been death. In the US during the first wave, daily deaths from COVID per day were often more than deaths on September 11th. We are entering the fourth year of this pandemic with huge impacts on society from deaths of so many people worldwide from COVID. They were mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, children, grandparents, and workers who will never be replaced. In part two, we'll be discussing the impact of workers and occupational health. COVID is an occupational disease. COVID has had a huge impact on the workforce in the U.S. A McKinsey report in January 2023 estimated that workers in the U.S. were off work with 191 million due to acute, mild, or moderate COVID infection, 60 million due to complying with isolation requirements after COVID infection, 45 million off due to long COVID, and 4 million off due to childcare issues, such as looking after sick children. Perhaps no other group has been the most affected than healthcare workers. During the first wave of the pandemic, there were stories emerging of healthcare workers who were evicted out of their homes because people were afraid they would bring disease back with them. Then came the time when frontline healthcare workers were celebrated as heroes with a 6 p.m. banging of pots. But now these frontline workers who caught long COVID on the job are struggling, sometimes too sick to work, but need to work financially, some facing dismissal because of their inability to do their jobs and their symptoms of long COVID. The BC WorkSafe COVID claims further illustrates that COVID is an occupational disease. The total COVID claims in BC as of December 31st, 2022 are 19,503, with healthcare workers having the highest number of claims at 10,185, and educational workers with the second highest number at 2,737. Another observation from the BC WorkSafe data is that long-term care workers make up 60% of the total healthcare worker COVID claims. This could be for a number of reasons. During the pandemic, it's come to light that long-term care workers are often from racialized new populations who are more willing to accept lower salaries paid in long-term care compared to acute care. They often need to work at more than one facility to make ends meet, leading to increased exposure to COVID. And in BC, long-term care Healthcare workers are not permitted to wear N95 masks, even if they purchase them themselves. Even though many studies have shown that N95 masks are superior to surgical masks for protection against airborne viruses. The rates of COVID infection in healthcare workers are also dependent on the frequency of exposures by the worker, with care aides having more exposure than nurses who often have more exposure than doctors. A new StatScan study showed that racialized and lower socioeconomic populations have had a higher mortality rate during the population, during the pandemic. Racialized populations tend to work in frontline jobs with a higher risk of COVID, such as factory jobs, packing plants, with less opportunity for social, for social distancing. People in lower socioeconomic populations often live in more crowded conditions with higher risk of COVID infections. The stats on the effects of racialized populations from COVID is being tracked in Ontario and many provinces, but unfortunately not in BC. 
Health authorities in Vancouver Island are now telling workers they long ago have to check for COVID, even if symptomatic, and they can come to work even if they have a COVID infection. This is not the only health authority recommending this in BC. The same health authorities in BC are now condoning having COVID infected and non-infected patients in the same room in hospitals and long-term care. These policies defy common sense and go against scientific principles and infection control, which we have been advocating for to protect patients and healthcare workers from COVID for the last three years. Part three, we're gonna discuss long COVID treatments. The best way to avoid long COVID is not to get COVID infections or repeat infections in the first place. This is why we need masks, improved ventilation, access to HEPA filters and vaccines. There are no current proven treatments for long COVID at this time, but we do know that graduate exercise programs have not worked and in fact can make long COVID symptoms worse. There are some treatments for some of the specific syndromes. For instance, ME-CFS can be managed with gentle exercise and CBT. POTS can be treated with beta blockers, glutocortisone, and increased salt intake. And there's a ray of hope. Dr. David Petrino at the Mount Sinai Health Group is spearheading a rapid interventional clinical trials internationally to look at treatments for long COVID. In yet another study from the Veteran Affairs databases in the US, Paxlovid has been found effectively to reduce the risk of long COVID in people regardless of vaccination status or first infection. The mechanism may be by decreasing viral remnants or a reservoir after COVID infection. However, in Canada, the access for Paxlovid is widely variable with BC having the most restrictive policies in Canada. Long COVID is real. One of the biggest challenges people with long COVID have faced is the recognition that they have long COVID. Often they've been told by their healthcare providers that they have burnout, depression, or it's just in their imagination. A University of Alberta study published in Lancet showed that people with long COVID who were stigmatized had decreased quality of life and decreased outcomes. Long COVID patients with worse symptoms face higher rates of stigma. There's also a correlation of higher rates of stigma with delays in diagnosis and treatment, as well as increased morbidity and mortality and poor overall prognosis. So, in conclusion, what we know about long COVID is this. Long COVID occurs in all age groups and in previously healthy people. The prevalence in Canada is now at least 15% of COVID cases, but is increasing rapidly. It is a multi-system disease with severe debilitating symptoms. It is a clinical diagnosis with no known test and is not a diagnosis of exclusion. In terms of the impact on workers and occupational health, COVID has had a huge impact on workers. It has led to disabilities from COVID and deaths from COVID have led to decreased numbers in the workforce. There's been impacts on racialized populations with increased mortality and morbidity. And as we've discussed, there has been a huge impact on healthcare workers. In terms of treatment, the best way to prevent long COVID is to prevent COVID infections and repeat infections. Long COVID is real. Validation recognition is one of the key components to treatment. Often in Western medicine, we dismiss diagnosis, which we cannot fully explain. Long COVID support groups and websites are often valuable resources for treatment. There are no established current treatments, but there's hope on, our rise, on the horizon with Dr. David Petrino and other research groups internationally spearheading rapid interventional trials looking into further treatments for long COVID. Long after the COVID pandemic is over, long COVID will still be with us. I'd like to leave uh, you with this quote by Dr. Ray Duncan, consultant cardiologist and long COVID researcher. The only thing worse than suffering from a chronic severe invisible disability is suffering from a chronic severe invisible disability that no one believes exists. These are some websites for COVID, long COVID support groups.
I'd like to thank you all for coming today and for listening to my talk. And thanks again. Uh, I feel very honored to have been offered this opportunity to come and speak. Dr. Koh, thank you very much. That was most informative and we appreciate the fact that you took your time uh, to educate us on this most important topic. I just want to cover some uh, Ontario background data and then we'll open it to questions and uh, discussions. Let me share my screen, share content. Share. Uh, from current slide. So, so one of the differences is on the testing and testing in, in, in Ontario has been restrictive in terms of where it was. Uh, there's new criteria out and um, these are the criteria. So anyone over 70 can get tested. Anyone over 60, uh, you know, you either f no first or partially immunized or six months from your last immunization, you can get uh, tested. So all, although there's some restrictions around testing, it's, I, I think it's, it's, you know, still freely available. Um, if you work with people who may be at a high risk of serious illness, you can get tested. If you identify it as an at-risk group, First Nations, Inuit, Métis, uh, if your health care provider wants you to get tested, uh, the public health tells you they want you to, to get tested. So various reasons. And, um, in terms of Paxlovid availability in Ontario, uh, you can get this directly from your pharmacist. You do not have need to see your physician if you meet the criteria. Uh, talking to Val the other day, she said some areas are still quite restrictive. Uh, in our area, I know it's it's been quite liberal. I've been getting many uh, sort of documentation from the pharmacies just saying your patient was here and tested positive to COVID and met the criteria and Paxlovid was given. So basically, again, fa fa fairly liberal criteria, at least to me, 60 years and older. Uh, would just on the age criteria, 18 to 59, if you immunocompromised or if you have any of the risk factors, even if you're not up to date uh, with your immunization. Um, wrong way. Uh, if you belong to any of the vulnerable groups, uh, indigenous, black, uh, racialized com communities, um, substance use disorder, mental use disorder. So, I think we should be encouraging it in the right population. Uh, it's available in Ontario. Uh, hopefully, uh, you know, pe people take this up and, and as was mentioned, it's probably gonna protect against long COVID. Uh, there are some serious uh, drug interactions. So, you know, if you go into your pharmacy, make sure you have a list of medications because uh, from experience, people have been going to different pharmacists uh, that don't always have the medical records. Uh, contact tracing again is is a little bit different in Ontario. Uh, isolation guidelines are different. Basically, they say if you test positive and you're asymptomatic, uh, take precautions and do whatever you do. Uh, if you test positive and symptomatic, the guideline is still isolate for ten days. Uh, healthcare is a little bit different uh, based on sort of resources, and and I know from experience, hospitals have cut down the ten days to seven, eight days. Uh, usually if you asymptomatic and two negative rapid testing, you can pr be brought back to work around day seven or day eight uh, with precautions. The guideline states uh, you can also bring back people earlier to work uh, if, if there's a significant shortage and, and you need to go, you know, bring back someone at day nine versus someone else at day eight. If you have the choice and if someone is if you're truly stuck, uh, you know, a, a positive worker can work with a positive patient as long as they are not significantly symptomatic. Uh, I, I think that's that's one of the discussion points that come up very often is that, um, you know, pe people look at results versus looking at symptoms and, and 
someone is still symptomatic after day 10, which we know from long COVID and ongoing COVID symptoms, is highly likely. Uh, lots of employees expect people to return to work at day 10, thinking um, everything is over. It's some magic that happens on day 10. And, and that was a stance that WSIB took initially. Everyone was expected to get back at day 14. Uh, in terms of Ontario, uh, these are just the raw claims data from WSIB. We see last year 20, uh, 23, 24,000 cases allowed of uh, COVID. And if you break this down, there's, there's a sort of trend um, towards acceptance of claims. Uh, from the earlier stats, you, you saw the range is like five to 10,000 cases per uh, weekly average that were going on. Or and and the last two months, if you look at November, November when I looked at the data, that was 300 and something, and December was 24 cases. So definitely a trend to not accepting claims at the same level as previously by the workers' compensation. Uh, definitely stating it's more from the community you get in this, and not from work block, work from your workplace. Although we know there's significant issues, especially with long term long term care, PSWs that to home visits and, and even other health facilities. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just throwing this out there because uh, personal interest, I, I just heard a talk yesterday about the gut uh, microbiome and, uh, and fibromyalgia. So some interesting research going on, on in fibromyalgia and, and the gut uh, microbiome and uh, research is using antibiotics to change the gut flora and, and help uh, patients with fibromyalgia at the very, very, very early stages of uh, work done. And we know that COVID-19 does disrupt the gut. And uh, Susan spoke about this. Uh, it allows pathogenic bacteria to thrive or it affects the lining of the gut, which allows these bacteria to enter the bloodstream and lead to dangerous secondary infections. And, and just by chance, the following one also came up on my screen is that the gut microbiome my, microbes may affect motivation to exercise. So basically what they did, they took some mice and, and they changed the gut flora and, and they were able to prove that by doing that, some mice uh, exercise less than the other mice. So, so there's an obvious connection between what's happening in your gut and your motivation. And, and they talk about the dopamine levels that are affected. So the gut brain connection is definitely there and, and it's something we need to watch for going forward. Uh, this is an interesting study that's happening in real time now, uh, can treat COVID. Uh, why I mentioned this is, is, you know, anyone can enroll in the study and, and the, they're looking at the effectiveness of different COVID treatment. Uh, they're looking at the cost effectiveness differences across uh, diverse populations. And uh, the third one, reducing post-acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2, long COVID. And they they have access to the latest different treatments, Plex over five days, Plex over 10 days, uh, the monoclonal antibodies, uh, the new interferons that they're talking about. Uh, so so it's, it's interesting. Um, so that's, that's my part on just some of the sort of Ontario perspective. And Tony, is it okay if I just get into a discussion with uh, Dr. Ko? Can you hear me, Dr. Ko? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, one, one of the things we're doing at OCAO is um, we're looking at groups of patients that had COVID, uh, either diagnosed uh, by testing or not diagnosed uh, uh, by swabbing. Uh, Tracy mm -hmm. Fina Snow, the occupational health uh, nurse from uh, Ottawa Clinic, is is heading this. Um, what's your thoughts on positive testing as the only way to diagnose uh, long COVID? Because I've kind of seen this all over the place in terms of the diagnosis and approach to long COVID. Any thoughts on that? Well, going back to the talk, um, there really are no clinical tests, like specific tests for long COVID. It's a clinical diagnosis, so it's not based on testing. And so uh, at this point in time, uh, we go by the patient's presenting symptoms. 
not there are no specific tests for long COVID. Okay, may, may, maybe I, I my fault. Sorry, I didn't ask the question properly. I'm talking about the initial positive COVID test. Like lots yes. of the patients that we have did not have a positive test initially. Yes, I know. I mean, all the signs and symptoms of uh, COVID of long COVID. You know, many of my patients um, also do not have positive tests. As you know, um, the rapid tests are in BC. We don't have access to PCR testing since basically January of 2022. And rapid testing has a very high false uh, negative rate. So just because someone has a false uh, has a false negative rapid test, it doesn't mean they didn't have COVID. But even before when PCR testing was available, um, sometimes patients would test too early. So they would test, say, on, for instance, day one of symptoms, and they would be negative, but they would have all the positive symptoms uh, of COVID. And in long-term care, this would often happen is that uh, patients would be tested on day one, they'd be negative. But because they had ongoing symptoms, we test them several days later on PCR and they'd be positive. So, in other words, a negative PCR testing, if the patient has all the symptoms of COVID, uh, still does not mean they don't have COVID. I, I still would believe, based on their clinical symptoms, that they have COVID. Yeah, thank, thank, thank you very much for that. And I think at at OCAL, that's what we've been sort of pushing to say that. You know, COVID is a is a clinical diagnosis, and and you know that's that's what we're working with. Uh, it's just that trying to prove in prove it to insurance companies and WSIB is 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 the big hurdle. Um, the second question I have um, is: Long COVID contagious? No, um, not that we know of. Um, you know, people with long COVID um, quite often um, the process, the disease process is sometimes weeks or uh, later. So at this point in time, they're probably most likely uh, not contagious. Although it's very interesting, uh, I think Nature Magazine had a recent article where they looked at, um, the US looked at doing autopsies on patients and they found remnants of COVID uh, in gut intestines, like sometimes three months after the person had uh, passed away from COVID. So, this brings up the question about, you know, organ transplant patients and that. Uh, so it's a very interesting question. But as far as we know, no, long COVID patients are not contagious. Thank you very much. And the following question is, you did mention uh, the best way to prevent long COVID is don't get COVID in the first place. Uh, mm -hmm. But do you have any other guidance around that? Uh, any other suggestions is once you get COVID, what can you do? I mean, I think you want to avoid getting infections and reinfections as much as you can. Um, you know, all those kind of protective things like masks, you know, better ventilation, uh, vaccinations, none of them by themselves work 100%. That's why you need to use all of them to help protect uh, ourselves. And one of the things, as you know, happening in society right now is that, um, unfortunately, the public has begun with the impression that the pandemic is over. And all of these things that we were used to protect ourselves against uh, a very dangerous virus, they're no longer available. So this is this is one of the problems we are facing right now, uh, that the pandemic is ongoing. And as you presented, you know, cases in Ontario and BC and hospitals are still going on, deaths are still going on, but and our hospitals are are very overrun in BC, and yet, you know, we are getting represented by provincial health authorities that this pandemic is over and don't have to wear masks anymore. And, and so this is a very difficult situation right now and a very dangerous part uh, time in our pandemic. Yeah, and I, and I would totally agree. It's, it's this uh, risk perception that, you know, we, we totally at low risk. And for some reason, it, it would seem that the politicians want, want that message to get across that we at low risk. Uh, just get on with your lives and figure out about all the precautions that we've had in place yeah. all along. So I, I, I think it's a, it's a major issue. And, and uh, you know, thanks to people like you that, uh, you know, keep keeping us educated and keeping the topic at, in the front lines. No, I, I think um, one of the things that's a shame is, you know, when we, things like mass mandates were made to uh, be like a punishment, and instead of making it be a punishment, I think if 
people had been educated about what the real effects of COVID were. If people knew that, you know, COVID, it's not just a cold, it's not just the flu, but it can give you all these terrible long-term effects. It can cause sudden cardiac death. It can cause strokes, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, you know, all these things. I think that they would be more willing to accept willing a mask. But because of the way it was presented to the public that uh, making it more of a punishment than as a social covenant, I think that's one of the things that we did wrong during this pandemic. Yes, I, I absolutely agree with you. And, and I think uh, what comes to mind for me is, is none of us will ever think about, you know, sitting in a car and not using a seatbelt. Because we totally understand that it was potentially what can happen. And, and I think for COVID somehow it's like, I don't know, let's just forget everything and move on. Um, whether it's frustration, whether it's a mixed messages, I, 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 I'm not sure. Um, another question we have is, um, if you have long COVID, uh, would you recommend the COVID vaccine? Definitely. I mean, it, just because you get an infection with COVID, it, it does not protect you from getting further COVID infections. Um, you know, the Nature article uh, from the Veteran Affairs Study shows that repeated infections with COVID lead to increased hospitalization, mortality, and more risk of long COVID. So I probably would not recommend they have the vaccine immediately after having a COVID infection because the first month after infection, um, your immune system is probably busy fighting off the infection. So it's, I think the current uh, guideline is to wait at least 30 days from the initial infection to get another vaccine. But yes, totally should get that second that vaccination. Thank you for that. And I apologize. I, I was kind of waiting for Tony to turn on my camera until I remembered, yeah, I'm supposed to do it. So sorry about that. <laughs> uh, how can you tell the difference between functional impairment from long COVID or from a mental health issue? It's a little bit of a difficult question, but if you just want to give us some guidance there. I think it's it's very difficult. Um, and you remember my case three, that patient. So she actually had underlying depression, anxiety, even before she uh, had the COVID infection. So that made it even more difficult um, to make her diagnosis. And so I think it'd be, I think, you know, patients with long COVID often have uh, functional impairments, and they often have depression and anxiety. So it can be very difficult to distinguish between the two. And 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 I think you you made an important point uh, during your presentation. You need to listen to your patient, know your patient, and trust your patient in in what what they are saying. Uh, yes. That's that's vitally important. I I think you know as as physicians we tend to kind of want to put everything in a box and say, these are the diagnostic criteria and this is where it fits. Uh, some of us will just look around the borders of the box and once it starts going further than that, it's like we we, we, we defeated and we don't want to be engaged in this anymore. And, and we know that from, if you look at chronic fatigue, uh, ME and uh, fibromyalgia, traditionally, we have always treated these conditions quite badly. Mm -hmm. uh, starting from a time where it's all in your head and we don't believe you and leave us alone and go away. Uh, and, and with time, our understanding evolved and we are, although, although not ideal, we, we, I mean, lots of physicians are, are not interested in these patient groups and don't want to treat these patients. Uh, and now we have long COVID, um, both with physical and uh, cognitive and psychological symptoms. So this, this has got all, all three in there. Which, which makes it very, very difficult. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, we, we just need more and more rehab places because it's a long journey and looking at the numbers, they, they significant and they're not, it, it's not going to go away. Um, so the next question is uh, follow up care and testing for patients with long COVID, any advice or direction there? You know, unfortunately in, in BC, our long COVID clinics are actually all closing. Um, some of them are going online, but the majority of them are about to close in the next few months. So these support groups and that I think are gonna become more important. Um, we have very few physicians in BC that currently treat um, long COVID. In uh, 
at the BC Women's Hospital, we have a complex, uh, complex chronic condition clinic, but the current wait time to get in to see anybody at that clinic is two years. So right now, you know, there is really, unfortunately, not really good avenue of treatment. And as you saw in my first case in that patient, that patient, um, because she was a registered nurse, she had actually more access, but she had all the testing available and she saw all the specialists, but because, you know, and often is the case with long COVID, none of those tests were positive. Her MRI scan was negative. Her pulmonary function test was negative. So the respirologist said, well, your lungs are fine. The, cardio the echocardiogram was normal. So the cardiologist said, your heart is fine. So unfortunately, testing has actually been, uh, actually had, had an adverse effect on her case because now works at BC says, oh, your specialists say you're fine. Your tests are fine. You're, you're good to go and go back to work, right? And, but again, if you listen to this patient, you know, the other day, this is two years after the pandemic, her baby was a bit sick and she had to lift the baby up out of the crib a few more times than, than usual. And that day, her entire, she was spent. She had to lie in bed most of the day and she didn't have enough breath to sing a lullaby to her baby that night. And yet, WorkSafe VC says she's good to go. So, you know, going back to listen to your patient, I mean, I've, I've been teaching medical students now for 17 years, right? And I'm sure you, this is what you teach your medical students, always listen to your patient, right? With long COVID, this becomes even more important. So I, I think WorkSafe VC needs to listen to what's happening with this patient rather than looking at her tests and the results, what the specials are saying. Yeah, I, I, to, I totally agree. And I don't think it's any different to the workers' compensation in Ontario. Uh, like I said, at one stage, it was just 14 days and now you better get back to work. And now mm -hmm. it's, they're looking at all the tests and, uh, you know, it's time for you to move on. I, I think uh, that that resource slide that you presented uh, on, on sort of uh, links to rehab facilities is quite good. The one that I looked at there and in, in sort of the Canadian resources for long COVID. And mm -hmm. I would encourage people to sort of browse that and, and look for places that uh, will help you out. W w one of the things that I find in, in clinical practice is that, you know, these, these patients are suffering and they need your help. And, you know, when all these testings come back negative, um, we need to look at functional improvement. So we have to figure out where's your function function now and how we're going to functionally improve it. We don't have any magic treatments. We don't have any, any magic at all. Uh, in my patients, what I find that if you don't measure it, you, you're never going to know in which direction the patient is, is heading. In the old days, we'll say, you know, just go out and do as much as you can. And, and we, now we understand the concept of post-exertional malaise that these patients end up significantly worse than where they started if you tell, give them that advice. What, what has been recommended and what I've been following is that, I don't know, pick a number, 70% of what you think you can do or 60% of what you can, can do and slowly reach those targets. And then, you know, you need to measure it and be gradually increase it and with time that it's, it's not a straight line. There'll be ups and downs, but eventually, hopefully things improve with time. Um, so from my side, I, um, don't have any more further questions. Uh, Val, you've been monitoring the chat line. Is there anything else there? Yeah, there are a few questions and some comments, um, and some already thanks um but uh i think that uh dorothy asked when you mentioned um mecfs um in your slides um and the similarities with long covid just on uh, you know is there anything else uh, you can comment around known or su suspected causes because it, it, i think maybe long covid has given some insight into that but also and then how that might be linked to work um so besides covid are there other um, work related aspects that that are potentially associated with uh, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. I think one of the interesting things that's emerging um, is that we think that with ME CFS, there's a viral uh, activation component. So Epstein-Barr virus now has been brought in herpes, human herpes viruses. 
uh, have been brought to light as maybe one of the mechanisms. And as you know, recently uh, with multiple sclerosis, uh, Epstein-Barr virus has also been uh, now known to be probably a primary cause. So I think that's definitely emerging. Um, and in terms of, you know, work safe, I mean, uh, people that have ME-CFS, it, it, it definitely affects them from an occupational point of view, you know, having those symptoms of pain, uh, sleep disturbance, the chronic fatigue, it, it definitely affects their ability to work. Uh, I'm not so sure that the work actually caused this, um, but it looks like there could be definitely a viral mechanism behind this. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Dorothy also shared some links in the chat from recent studies, the long COVID study in nature in January, and also the Today Show uh, segment on heart. Um, I don't know if you saw it uh, yesterday. That was quite yes, good and that. thorough, right? And, and yeah, quite, that was quite amazing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, and it's, yeah. it's amazing yeah. that we think it's amazing that mainstream media even covered it now, right? That that's, uh, that's considered to be revolutionary now to have mainstream media even acknowledge the prevalence and severity of health consequences, so. I think we're gonna see more and more. I mean, as we see more things happen like this, it, it's going to be an unavoidable truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've all been, I think, waiting the, oh, one day the, the, the you know, the mountain of uh, evidence, uh, I guess, will be so clear that it, that we'll have to do something about it. But uh, now, as you, you mentioned, it's the fourth year uh, and there's been such an effort to try and normalize the, the situation um, in terms of individual health and population health and in workplaces. Um, uh, I don't know. Uh, I was going to ask, there's a couple other questions, but I was going to ask, I guess, have either of you found ways to affect change in your own, in your own work um, and to be able to influence your own sphere of influence and, and work, what was successful in doing that, I guess, or even any little bits of ability to influence um, uh, Prevention well, strategies, non-pharmaceutical interventions, that kind of thing. I can tell you about a failure and a success. So the failure is I've been trying to fight for N95 masks in long-term care facilities uh, that I work for the last, you know, close to four years, and I have not been successful. Um, we thought, you know, about a year and a half ago when they got fit tested that hooray, you know, they're going to get N95 masks now. But unfortunately, fit testing is just a requirement, but they actually did not give uh, any of the healthcare staff N95 masks. So that's, I'm still fighting, but unfortunately that's a bit of a failure. Um, I guess a relative success. Um, so in August of 2022, um, when we really didn't know as much about COVID as we do now, um, I was a part of a group of parents and we successfully, um, you know, convinced the Vancouver School Board that COVID was serious. So the Vancouver School Board was one of the only uh, school districts that had hybrid learning. Uh, and uh, this could be why, you know, if you take a look at the number of cases in Vancouver uh, of COVID during the first phase of the pandemic, we were much less than Surrey, which, so we only had 16 kids uh, in person and then six, and they would kind of switch over. Um, where Surrey had the full classes of say 30 kids in person fully. So we did manage to uh, dissuade the school board and they, and they did listen. There was a very good um, school superintendent at that time, um, Suzanne Hoffman, who, who listened and she really cared. And so that, so, you know, sometimes uh, there are people out there that care about uh, safety and, and COVID safety in, in schools, and, but, Right now, we're still fighting for that. Uh, Ontario, you're doing much better than we are. I, I, I've heard that you have HEPA filters in all classrooms, but in BC right now, uh, unfortunately, we had to switch to another school superintendent who is not as uh, caring about uh, COVID safety. It's more kind of uh, towing the government line. And so parents in uh, BC are fighting apparently to have HEPA filters put in classrooms uh, because many of our classrooms were not, uh, they were not able to put in MER 13 filters. They only put them in uh, where they could, even though I believe the federal government gave millions of dollars for upgrades for ventilation for both schools and I think in uh, hospitals. 
I'm not sure how much uh, that money was used in the hospitals either. Yeah, it's challenging the differences between provinces and then even between regions. We see that even and have seen it even more so in the past between public health units and medical officers of health uh, willing to uh, step out from the party line or not or, or find a way. Um, it, Dorothy also makes comments that was related to the Paxlovid uh, comments that you made, Pravesh, about what about like there's a long list of, of um, risk factors shouldn't um, shouldn't certain occupations so besides healthcare other occupations where people work or live in congregate settings um, or have other other risk factors um, potentially be included in that but um, yeah I, I think I think that's on the list any high risk setting mm -hmm. so, so that a, they have access to Paxlovid. So um, that's a matter of educating the healthcare yeah. providers mm -hmm. and the pharmacists, I guess, that, that they qualify then, or in educating yeah. workers to ask for it? Educating workers to ask for it. But now that it's in, in sort of the pharmacies, I'm sure Shoppers is going to be advertising that. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's become a commercial thing now, and they do a significantly better job at that than we do. I, I just want to comment on, on the last point. Uh, sure, yes, keep that similar experience in, in sort of healthcare because I'm involved in healthcare in, in terms of health and safety. Um, sort of the official advice you give them, if it doesn't fit with what they get from public health, it, it doesn't fly. Mm -hmm. And then after a while you find that you sort of at quite far from the decision makers uh, for you can figure that out yourself that mm -hmm. uh, if, if your views don't, uh, you know, yeah. align with public health and N95 and, and ventilation and everything else, and slowly you just get moved to the sideline and the steering committee will make all the decisions that yeah. uh, just follows public health. The other point I wanted to make, Val, was uh, when, we, when we spoke about sort of the numbers and, and uh, WSIB is, is when we look at things that are attributed to COVID, it, like you may have cardiac failure and you may be stable, uh, but you can get COVID that can, you know, throw you into significant yes. cardiac failure. So that, that to me is still as a result of COVID. Mm -hmm. So it's attributed to COVID and people talk about excluding secondary, excluding other causes. You may do that clinically, but in terms of workers' compensation and everything else, it's still attributed to COVID. If it were not for the COVID, you would be uh, significantly healthier than you were. And, and we've seen people, you know, diabetics that have been diagnosed far sooner now. And I mean, you may have had some risk factors, but now suddenly post COVID you're diabetic. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's, it's important how we track those statistics because, you know, it's easily by definition to say that's all not related to COVID. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think we, we know otherwise. Mm -hmm. Val, can I talk yeah. about Paxlovid? Yeah. Because um, you know, we in BC are very envious of your Paxlovid uh, access in Ontario because in BC we have the most strict, uh, the least uh, access to Paxlovid. So in BC, if you are a not immunocompromised person, you have and you're fully immunized with three vaccines, you have to be 70 years old and have three medical conditions on their list. And there's a few other things that qualify uh, before you can get Paxlovid. So there's immunocompromised, there's, there's Indigenous, but we have very few people that qualify comparing to your list in Ontario. So in Ontario, I believe it's 60, and you have all those social determinants of health that qualify. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, in Ontario, you can get it from pharmacies. Uh, we still don't have uh, the ability to do that. And so we are actually very envious that uh, you have much better uh, access to Paxil than we do. And, and again, access to a drug that can decrease hospitalization and death in long COVID should not be limited by what province you live in. Mm -hmm. right? And I believe in Manitoba, New Brunswick is at 18 and some other factors that qualify and, and it's at 50 in Saskatchewan. So uh, again, this is a, a drug provided by the federal government. and. You know, I, I really don't know why in BC there's such uh, restrictions because I believe as of December 2022, we have thousands, uh, 139,000 doses I've heard 
in December that were still being unused. And according to the local pharmacists I talked to recently, in another three weeks, a whole batch of them are about to expire. So why not get them out to people to, you know, even for average age, you know, people 50 and up in that uh, annals of internal medicine study, uh, Paxlovid decreased hospitalizations by 44% and deaths by 71% in average risk people and 50 is the inflection point uh, after age 50 with a COVID infection your chance of hospitalization and death go much higher yeah that is um, all of this is is reminding me that we should probably do more knowledge translation in terms of a resource about for workplaces about Paxlovid so that workplaces can support that too and educate workers because that's another problem well not only the tension between uh, you know uh, federal or national health policy or or even like uh, funding policy but then the individual provincial uh, uh, interpretations of that is is you know creates this dissonance and tension uh, uh, across across the country but also that even when they make a policy that seems like it's a an advanced policy in Ontario I'm not sure that work individuals in the public understand it. Never mind, even I don't not sure if family doctors necessarily uh, they like they know there's something they should know about Paxlovid, but do they actually understand all the nuances and that mo you know many of their patients could benefit from it? Um, and I think it was one of our colleagues actually who phoned um, Telehealth Ontario and and. And uh, given her age and health history, uh, I, I'm astonished that she was told she probably wasn't a candidate. Now, maybe it was uh, maybe it was a timing thing by then. Um, but I think uh, public education, um, I think, is is also um, a chronic problem um, or a chronic lack that we've mm -hmm. tried to fill. And others, some some um, public health units are much better than others. In which I see Dorothy's put in something from. Peterborough, yes, uh, uh, Dr. Thomas Piggott and the Peterborough um, um, Health Unit have done a, an amazing job, actually, in leading the province in their uh, knowledge translation, including for indoor air quality. So we we'll hope to get him here for a chat one day, but uh, he's a busy guy, I think. Um, I just wonder if the, I'm just looking to see if there's any other questions. There's, there's a few rhetorical questions in terms of like Lynn's question about why have you know workers Ontario um, Safety and Insurance Board and uh, WorkSafe BC basically, although they still call themselves prevention, they've they've become an insurance focus um, without without you know um, learning from what they you know should be learning with all these signals of of injured and ill workers and turning that around for prevention. So I don't know if either one of you has any comments on that. So Val, just to comment, uh, I know we were working on the poster, the COVID committee was working on the poster of masking. Uh, maybe we should be working on a poster on Plaxovid. Yeah. To <laughs> send that out to the workforce. To yeah. Say, hey, this, this, is, this is what you're entitled to. Yeah. These are the reasons you should get it. Yeah. Yeah, I think we should. And something, um, something for um for, for migrant farm workers or other marginalized workers yeah. who wouldn't yeah. even necessarily um access the website or whatever like just mm -hmm. thinking about different avenues of communication to get the information out um uh, i don't know if does anybody mm -hmm. have a, a question they want to pose to um dr ko or to add to the discussion mm -hmm. um kevin you comment about experience in newfoundland um and and Difficulty accessing antivirals there too. Dorothy, did you want to ask a question? Yeah, you just uh, this comes out of the conversations we've been having around migrant farmers and thinking about just a couple of folks um, on the call here, outreach workers. And so, you know, we we work with various uh, groups that support these folks. We go to we're starting to go to events and um, you know, the folks from Ocow are the only ones bringing the CO2 monitor and the Kersey Rosenthal box and wearing a, a respirator. Um, I sort of look like Darth Vader because I use a breathe one, the one that sort of is a box in front of your nose and mouth. Um, but one of the things we're really wrestling with is just sort of the message 
messages that we should be delivering to the groups that are supporting these folks as well as the workers. And I'm just curious about what, you know, given the general feeling that that uh, incorrectly that that you know this the pandemic's done and let's get on with our lives what you folks are what are thinking about there's messages that people need to hear and and particularly in the case of of uh, migrant farm workers who are really scared of saying anything often because it jeopardizes their jobs um but uh, and the groups working with them who are just trying to do good you know good work but Good intentions, but not always paying attention to these kinds of protections. I mean, I think, you know, every person is is very smart. If you were to tell them, you know, this virus is serious, right? This virus can cause long-term effects on every system in your body. Uh, if you were to tell them the seriousness of this, and this is why you need to have protections like masks, this is why you need to get vaccinated, I, I think they would understand. Right, so I think in situations like this, where um, migrant workers they're working in uh, occupations where there's not much opportunity to social distances and they're much higher risk, having these protections is very important. But I think right now, with the message going across uh, all governments that the pandemic is over, you don't have to worry. Um, this is the wrong message. So I think that message needs to come across that the pandemic is not over. You still need to protect yourself. And this is why this is this virus is serious, right? This virus can affect your health, can affect your family's health, and it's a long term effect. Mm -hmm. it, that's really difficult to say when public health says, don't worry. Mm -hmm. I, know, and, I know. And so I was I asked a question in the chat about distinguishing between what public health recommends and what they're requiring. And how do you use those recommendations? How do you point people? to those recommendations, which sometimes are, you know, useful, um, but they're not being required. Any thoughts about that? That's that's part of the other, that's another part of the discussion we're, we're having. I think, uh, you know, risk risk communication is notoriously difficult and, and it's not, it's it's a science by itself. How, how do you communicate risk and how do you get people to understand it? And, and people have a variant tolerance level uh, on what they're prepared to take. I mean, if you just look at smoking, people understand it's bad for you, yet they'll still smoke and, you know, downplay the risk. When it comes to marginalized communities and vulnerable workers, there are significant other factors, social factors that are in play. And, and I always believe it's easier for me to be standing here and preaching. Uh, they have true real, real life situations in terms of production. If I'm going to produce and I have a quota, can I wear this mask in this hot place for the entire day? It's it's just practically very difficult. And if it's affecting their livelihood and income, uh, it's it's a hard choice for them. And and I think the right as a society, it's it's more you don't want to pe put people in, in situations where they have to make a hard choice between, you know, surviving and their own health. It's it's how do we get out of those situations? more than the individual themselves, at least that's, that's the way I, I look at it. We shouldn't be pe putting people in, in that, because if I put you in that situation, you're going to say, okay, I'm going to do what's best for my family. It's okay if I sacrifice myself. That's, that's yeah. a natural tendency. And just one final thing, back in the day when I started health and safety, I was really influenced by a slogan that our health is not for sale, but it is so clear that our health is for sale uh, if in so many jobs these days, and particularly around this pandemic, um, that people, like you say, uh, uh, have been really put in those uh, horrible uh, yes. positions. So we're trying to do our best to sort of mm -hmm. deliver messages and provide examples and uh -huh. just looking for clues anywhere. It's it's very difficult situation. I mean, I, I see this when I'm working in long-term care because, mm -hmm. you know, they, they would like to wear the, the, the N95 masks, but they can't. And even when they're looking after the COVID patients, they're not allowed to wear N95 masks. But you know they can't afford to not go to work, right? And they have to continue doing that. That's they've been told this is what you need to do. It's such a difficult uh, situation. And you know, 
and you know, I understand. I mean, right now, this is the fourth year of the pandemic. Everyone is tired of this, right? And so we would like, all of us would like this to be over as well, but um, it's a very difficult uh, time for everyone. That seems so ridiculously draconian to forbid anyone from having um, a, an, you know, a better uh, grade of, uh, of personal protective equipment that's readily available, right? It's not like they're, um, you know, I mean, yes, they cost more than a medical mask, but they don't cost hundreds of dollars more. Um, so it, it does seem ridiculous. Um, they're not allowed uh, to use their own valve. Pardon? Yeah, I know they're not allowed to bring their own in. I know that the, 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 the whole, you know, myth that it could be contaminated if it comes from outside is, uh, it just, uh, it's a control thing, I guess. And I was going to ask, Kevin, I know you've got a question, but particularly in BC, but I guess in general, do you think like policies like that really seem to be meant to foster infection? Uh, do you think that they're actually like striving for the myth of herd immunity, which the science tells us is unlikely to ever be possible with this virus as it's mutating, or maybe not for thousands of years, but I, 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 maybe that's a rhetorical question in terms of what are they thinking, I guess, but I don't know if, if you think, if there's been any actual, that, that seems to be the suspicion around uh, sending all the kids back to school and not having protection, so. Here in Ontario, every school or every classroom without a window was supplied with one air cleaner, I believe, but I'm not sure, um, A, that they were, you know, sized and scaled um, to, for the classroom and the load in the classroom. And also, oh, and I think maybe it was actually only schools without an HVAC system or, or windows, something like that. And also um, a lot of them get turned off because they weren't, because they're loud. Um, so that's been a problem that the, the design, that they're not deployed in a way to operate quietly. So you have three or four of them operating quietly instead of one. So, so loud that people just turn it off. So, um, well, it, it's, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Susan though. Yeah. Do you have any, I, I was just going to say in B in the Vancouver school board, they've only been six schools supplied with a few HEPA filters, mm -hmm. uh, as far as I know. And that's because I, I work. I live in that district and we've been fighting as parents for, and they won't let parents even donate uh, HEPA filters, right? Mm -hmm. Or even make Corsi Wolfensall boxes. It's just like a no, because uh, the health authority says no, right? Yeah, that's, that's once again, it's draconian and, and seems criminal from our perspective, but every, like, hence why we keep trying to do this education and we, we are trying to uh, teach people when we can how to build CR boxes and uh, and their um, practical use for so many things, not just for viruses. So uh, hopefully that one step at a time. So Kevin, you wanted to uh, add something? Yeah, I just wanted to get um, on both of your comments. Thank you very much for the presentations and the discussion has been fabulous. Um, but I just wanted to get your, um, your comments on um, uh, it's around evidence-based medicine using randomized control trials, you know, to, to, to prove a point. And, and you'll know that the multi-center study from McMaster, the Loeb uh, study has been published in the Annals of Internal Medicine. And there's been a lot of comments about that study. And, um, you know, I think about, uh, there's a well-known um, occupational health and safety champion from the US called Dr. David Michaels. And he wrote a book called Doubt is Their Product. And I just think about this in the context of, you know, the manufacturing of doubt. And, and you think about the, the low uh, study where it was set up sort of designed to fail. And, and, you know, when they might have got some really good information, then they went overseas and they, they recruited, you know, uh, people from Egypt and Israel. And it kind of murkied the study and it, it made the confidence intervals look so wide. And, and recently, there's also been a Cochrane review to mm -hmm. show that, that masks aren't effective <laughs> because, and it's, once again, it's trying to compare apples with oranges and not apples with apples. And I'm just wondering, like, and they're powerful studies. They they help set the direction for policy and and for for regulators. Um, I'm just wondering what your 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 thoughts are in that area, um, if if you wouldn't mind sharing it with them for us. 
the the Cochrane report was so disappointing. I mean, and one of the reports they're citing uh, is that Connolly study, uh, the RCG study, which is really heavily flawed because in that study, the nursing staff only wore N95s if they thought they were going to be exposed to COVID, which, as you know, in many cases, people are asymptomatic and they didn't wear it for a lot of the, the time of the day. So really, how can you possibly say the N95s are, are not working as effectively as surgical masks? Uh, it was not a very well done study. Uh, but, you know, RCTs, I think, are overrated. I mean, a lot of the, the data we have on COVID right now comes from Veteran Affairs. Uh, those are not RCTs. You know, those are big, you know, real time, you know, what's going on, uh, what's happening with people studies. Uh, and I think, you know, if Cochrane is bringing up uh, RCTs as the only basis, then I, I'm not sure they, you know, they looked, uh, there's Raina McIntyre 2013 RCT study. That was an excellent study. And that did show that N95 masks were superior. So uh, it kind of it is very disappointing that, that Cochrane would uh, put a study up like that about masks. And in a time where, you know, uh, we are trying to help protect people, right? And very disappointing. Thank you. See, uh, I guess this is a question for you, Pravesh, that someone specifically asking whether OCOW has assessed workers for sequelae, uh, example, cardiac events, and have any of these cases been accepted by WSIB? If you want to um, yeah, we have accept, uh, we have assessed workers for complications arising out of uh, COVID. Um, still sitting on the WSIB, no, no response yet. I think we did have some acceptance on, I'm trying to figure out what was it. Um, I can't remember if Tracy is on there, she'll, she'll remember what we got accepted. Tracy, I'm not sure if she's around. Um, I, I think it, it may have just been for COVID uh, from the workplace, long-term mm -hmm. care, stuff like that. I don't know, Tracy, if you're around. Uh, but def definitely quite a few cases on, on the complications of COVID, uh, but still sitting mm -hmm. at the WSIB. And some of them are still being worked up. Just based on your chart, uh, where th you know the bulk of the cases being from 2022, which was Omicron, which is also mm -hmm. you know the the shrug your shoulders and it not us shrugging our shoulders, but others um, that it's in the communities um, that I think is going to make it even harder. So the later cases, mm -hmm. um, even though they may be you know manifestly impacted, will be. Will be even harder, I think, more to, and more to fight because more denials, yes. and more initial yeah. denials. Well, you saw those WSIB numbers. I mean, yeah. they accepted yeah. twenty-four that December. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Lynn did actually put some information in here about the three-month delay post uh, infection for a booster. Is the guidance in BC? And I think that might be here too. Um, three to six months mm -hmm. is what I've heard, depending on depending on your risk factor in terms of the severity of what's happening in your environment and your own health um, situation, your age, your other uh, comorbidities and things like that. Yep. I don't know if, if anybody else has um, any other questions or, oh, the, this question I think is a good one. Can a doctor write a prescription for wearing N95 for vulnerable worker workers for as a reasonable accommodation issue. I don't know if either of you have any experience of that. Mm, it won't fly. I've tried it. Mm. It won't fly. <laughs> so it wouldn't fly in the workplace or was WorkSafe BC involved in that and judging that it was inappropriate accommodation or? It won't fly because uh, what it comes down to is the workers said, is told, this is the, the health policy, the health authority policy. And if you want to work here, this is the policy. So, in other words, you know, and I myself uh, had an experience on, I was, I volunteered at the vaccine clinics when, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the COVID vaccine clinics first started. And the first uh, four shifts, I wore my N95 masks, which were really hard to get at that point. But the provincial government actually supplied me a box every three months of 20 masks. So I wore that for my shifts of work. 
And uh, nobody said anything to me the first four shifts because they're having a lot of trouble getting people to work at those vaccine centers because initially it wasn't clear that people were going to be paid. It was like, sound like a volunteer job. So the first four shifts was myself and a lot of retired nurses and some medical students. So anyway, my fourth shift, they said, why are you wearing that mask, N95 masks? And I said, well, to protect myself. And they said, you're not at risk. I said, well, I'm in close contact with 80 plus patients per shift that have never been immunized. Uh, of course I'm at risk. And the matter went all the way up to the top, uh, the director of family medicine of uh, Providence. And I said to her, well, you know, in Germany, people wear N95 masks even when they're going out on the bus, the German government provides it. But I was told, no, you, you don't need to wear an N95 mask. And, and basically, if you want to work at our vaccine clinic, you're not allowed to wear an N95 mask, All right? You have to wear these blue, you know, very flimsy uh, surgical masks. They weren't even level three, they're just the blue floppies. And so I said, okay, well, by then, they, it was known that people were going to get paid to work, so they didn't really need me. Mm -hmm. So they had a lot of volunteers to be to come to work, right? But before that time, it was like I was getting a text every week. This and this center needs people to work. This and that center need someone to work in the vaccine clinic here and there, right? But once they that people knew that they were going to get paid, there's no problem. And uh, you know, they it's it's a very interesting thing because in BC they decided to freeze family doctors out from giving COVID vaccines because you know traditionally family doctors and pharmacists we've been giving flu vaccines and and other vaccines for years now, but um, family doctors were not included in the vaccine uh, campaign at all, which is quite surprising. Right. May I ask a question? Yeah, and then we have Shamil in line too. So okay. yeah, so. Susan, you just said that you went into the beginning of the pandemic, assuming you needed a respirator. The big question that I keep being asked, because I'm writing a book about this and called Transmission Truth, but also because I work as a hygienist, um, is why did you under why did you think you needed a respirator? Where did you learn that viruses like SARS-CoV-2 are aerosols or could be airborne? And what makes you different from other doctors? I mean, this is already January 2021. So, I mean, a lot of that evidence was already out, right? That it was an airborne virus. I mean, if you look back, um, we already knew, I think it was March of 2020, there was that group of, uh, there's a choir in Washington State. Skagit. Right? Mm -hmm. The Skagit. Skagit County. Yeah. yeah. And they were socially distanced in a church, and yet many of them got sick, and I think several of them died. And then there was also at that time, we already knew the evidence from Korea and in South Korea, they they gen, they genotype the virus. So we so there is that restaurant. So we knew that one person in the restaurant transmitted the virus to someone 20 feet away. So it was obviously an airborne virus. And there's other Korean studies where one person uh, in a hematological ward went to the washroom, took off their mask, or brushed their teeth. 45 minutes later, there's another worker who went into the same bathroom, didn't know the first worker had COVID, took off their mask and brushed her teeth and caught COVID from the first worker, even though it was 45 minutes later. So the virus also hangs around in the air for a long time. So at that point in August, 2021, these studies are already out there. So it was just a matter of, you know, reading. I mean, if you, if you were interested, you read those studies, so. So it wasn't before the pandemic? No. Okay. It was, I mean, but. By that point, and when we started doing vaccinations, it was, I believe, January of 2021 or maybe later, February. Anyway, at that point, there's actually a lot of evidence that it was an airborne virus. And so, of course, you would wear a respirator for uh, protection against the airborne virus. Mm -hmm. So we've been saying over and over and over again, Shamil, you have a question? Thanks, Dorothy. Uh, yeah, so I'm just wondering, it's just, uh, it's interesting to me, what is the is there a legal precedent for this hesitation or this dismay, I guess, with wearing a respirator? Because it just seems strange that, you know, it's it's sort of being downplayed and workers are, you know, being told that, you know, maybe it's not the best thing if you wear one. You know, I, I don't know. There's Is there any legal precedent in Ontario? I think, 
Um, I because think it seems to me that, you know, the workers right or the individuals right to where it should, you know, take precedent above anything else. Hmm. Even, you know, in regards to this health policy, because even when I'm, you know, here at UCSF Berkeley, everywhere I go, it, it's your choice. You want to wear it, you wear it, and regardless of what setting you're in. So I believe in Quebec, the nurses actually sue the government and run the right to wear N95 masks. But in in BC, I don't think uh, that has ever come to pass that anyone has brought the government. But the problem is this. So I was at the hospital the other day, and you know, I, I visit patients in the hospital and I sometimes see patients in emergency. And I looked around and you know what? I was the only person wearing N95 mask. Uh, there's a couple other specialists that were. And I was in the OR doing a surgical assist two weeks ago. And myself and one scrub nurse was the only person wearing an I-5 mask. So unfortunately, it, it's not just the public. Um, in, in BC, healthcare workers have been also led to believe uh, that this is not a serious virus. And in fact, I was in the emergency department and I heard uh, one of the emergency doctor colleagues tell a patient, oh, you know, your your COVID is not that serious. And, you know, COVID is just kind of like the cold or a flu. And, you know, you've been vaccinated, right? And I was really shocked. And, uh, you know, and I know that colleague and, and that person is a very you know, good doctor and a, and a nice person, but I was really shocked. So if if our own doctors are believing this kind of thing and they have been led by public health to believe that COVID is not serious and that it's a cold and that you don't have to wear an N95 mask because it's just, you know, another virus, then then we have a lot of work ahead of us. Yeah, I see Dorothy just posted in the chat too. This is this is interesting as well. So I have to look into this. There was, I mean just uh yeah, go ahead. No, I'm I'm just wondering if we could look at other health and safety legislation to see if there's anything similar for for example, if you know. If I'm working at heights and my harness is double my sort of uh, strength that it can hold 200 Ks, uh, is there anything in the legislation from stopping the employer to say, you know, I want this harness to hold 500 Ks? Like, will someone come there and say, no, you're not allowed to do that? It's it's very, as I understand it in Ontario, it's very complex because the Occupational Health and Safety Act definitely has the general duty clause, take every precaution reasonable in the circumstances. And generally that means protect people as best you can, right? Mm -hmm. and, and there's a minimum, um, but but there's a, not, not a maximum of how much you can protect workers. But ONA, the Ontario Nurses Association, did take the um, to the hospitals to to court or a grievance or something like that around um, around this issue of um, of only being able to have access to them if they'd done, um, a, a, you know, um, a a assessment and that they should have free access and there was a number of um, a number of infection prevention and control uh, doctors who testified for the hospital association that that um, that it was only droplet precautions and that um, and that essentially N95s were overkill and taking them away from people who needed them in other industries and things like that or um, and, and and those people, those same people, uh, we we now see are involved in the in the um, Loeb and Connolly paper, right? It's a, there's a, it's it's the same voices, um, but they're very loud and very influential. Um, and um, so, yeah, that, that's, so that's a topic for another day to some extent. And and we have done some, uh, we've done several as uh, over the years of uh, our, our COVID conversations because it's it's a it's it's an ongoing issue. Is how can we um, better protect people um, with the tools we have access to? Um, and of course, masks are the easy thing in the short term. Not they're not a long term solution. Ventilation. And, management of the, you know, the, where you put people and who you expose and all that. There's a lot of um, non-pharmaceutical controls we know, but. So it is, um, it is three o'clock. I, um, I don't know if there's anybody else that has anything burning uh, to say there's some good comments about, and yes, Quebec, I think has stepped up also through the, through the um, labor relations system, I think, and that the, Nurses have better access there now, um, and so we may 
try and cover that. They have a new policy right now. It's only in French. So when we have an English version and then we can invite somebody uh, to come and speak, we may co cover that at one of these uh, COVID conversations. And we have lined up someone for March the 3rd who's going to talk about critical incident investigation um, and how you apply that to infectious disease and to an outbreak or even a fatality in a workplace using the, you know, which is part of occupational health and safety framework to investigate injuries and accidents so you can identify the root causes and prevent them in the future. Um, so I think that will be um, very important. But before uh, um, before we sign off, I would like to uh, thank Susan, thank Pravesh, and also ask you if you have any kind of final comments um, about, you know, just about everything that's come up today or anything else that you'd like to offer to the audience. Just, just like to thank you very much again. It's a real honor uh, to be able to present to you today. Thank you very much for listening, everyone. You're welcome. We thank you. I really appreciate your time. Professor, did you have anything else? No, you just to just uh, thank Dr. Ko and thank Okab for allowing me to do the presentation. And and uh, mm -hmm. I I think just for people to understand that the numbers are real and and. You know, we're going to see more and more as as time goes on. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think long COVID is going to be with us long after the COVID pandemic is over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and we didn't even touch on today the impact on children. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't even know what that's going to look like as they grow older and become adults and, and, um, and how the impact of multiple infections will affect them. So... I know that that's a real concern. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So thanks everyone. I saw a question. Yes, we do. Uh, we do uh, record these sessions, so they will be up on this will be up on YouTube next week, but we actually had it on our Facebook uh, live right now. So someone can go and watch it immediately afterwards. It will render and be there as a video. Um, and then it'll be um, edited on our on our YouTube page and it will be linked to the post for this event, um, which I can put in the chat again. I think I have it right handy here. I know when people come in and out, they don't necessarily see the whole chat. So I'll put it back here. The 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 end the slides, um, both sets of slides will get posted there um, as well, uh, probably by early next week. So we'll say um, farewell for now and uh, thanks very much uh, for joining us and we'll see you in three weeks um, and we'll send out information about signing up for that event next week. Thank thanks you. again, Dr. Ko, and thanks uh, Pravesh as well. Thank you very much. Take bye -bye. care. Bye-bye.